you folks. As you've probably seen, I've been creating again. This is a little bit of a preview, perhaps setting the stage for a potential video. A tiny bit of update. I have a lot of video ideas in mind. I don't know how much I'll actually be able to put out. I'm going to do my best. It certainly meant a lot that people have continued watching content over the years and have been so positive towards my material. It really means a lot. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to get to is a Red Dead Revolver roleplay. I think it's come up in the comments a few times. As a little bit of preparation for that. This is going to be a pretty casual video. Just reading a bit of history of the West. This book might be familiar as it looks old. It tends to play a prop role in my videos. So I'm just going to do a little bit of reading from that. Something you could put on the background desired. Perhaps a couple triggers. But I would love to hear from all of you. Is a Red Dead roleplay something that you're interested in? And if so, what would you like to see me include if I were going to make that video? I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I should point out that this is an old book, so some of the language, style, and ideas might be old. I think I've chosen sections which aren't particularly egregious, but it's worth noting. Boots. A cowboy might spend lavishly when he bought a hat, but he really spread himself where boots were concerned. Price was no object. Boots were often custom maids, the cowboy with pride having little use for the ready-made variety. The boots had vamps of the finest quality of pliable thin leather. They fitted tightly around the instep. The legs of finest kid were loose and came to the knee. Boots with flapping pull-on straps at the tops were called mule ears. Features of a pair of riding boots included high tops, high heels, sharp toes, thin soles, and fancy stitching, and there was a reason for each.
the high tops prevented brush and gravel from working into the boot, and their looseness allowed the air to circulate and prevented sweating. Later, the peewee, a short and dressier boot with less weight, became stylish, but the cowman shunned low-topped boots. The peewee. When riding, he pressed his heels downward, and the top of a low boot soon worked below the bottom of his pants in the rear. This created a funnel to trap gravel and twigs that the horse kicked up. With high-top boots, there was no space to act as a catch-all. And two, they could be worn inside or outside the pant legs. High-tops were also a protection against stirrup leathers, bumps, and brush. High heels were an important factor. They kept the rider's foot from slipping through the stirrup and hanging. They let him dig in when roping on foot and gave a secure footing in all groundwork. There were many times when he could not afford to slip when handling a plunging bronc. The heels were not only high but narrow, set under the foot and sloped from behind. With the heel under his foot, the rider's stirrup was held securely under the arch. This gave the cowboy a firm but easy long-legged seat. Riding was less tiring than when the weight was on the toes or ball of the foot. This narrow, undersloped heel could also prevent a thrown rider from being hung up, hanging from the stirrup by one foot and dragged to death. With a western saddle, a thrown rider might carry the long stirrup over the seat and if he fell on his back, fell with his back to the horse, a square boot heel would tend to hold him to the side of the frantic animal. A heel with an underslope would permit him to slip to the ground. The cowboy wanted the toes of his boots to be pointed because sharp toes made it easier to pick up the near stirrup on a wheeling or prancing horse, as well as to find the right hand stirrup after he hit the saddle. A thin sole let the feel of the stirrup come through. A soft vamp gave more comfort. Fancy stitching was not just for decoration. It had practical value. Stitching stiffened the leather so that the tops would not break down and become sloppy. It prevented wrinkling at the ankles where the boot contacted the stirrups. It preserved the tops and kept them together when the leather wore thin. Stitching, too, served another purpose. A cowboy took pride in having small feet. He wanted his boots to fit tightly and appear as though his feet had been poured into them. The fancy toe stitching made his foot look shorter. Toe stitching also made the boot more comfortable by keeping the lining close to the outside leather. Ideally fitted for work in the saddle, the cowboy's boots were plainly made not for walking. In fact, so used, they were crippling. But no cowboy ever planned to walk. Sombreros. A cowboy's hat had to be of best quality to stand up under hard usage, and it had many uses in addition to covering his head. Often called sombrero from the Spanish, it was variously known as hair case, conch cover, lid, or war bonnet. I'm going to start calling all hats conch covers. A certain Philadelphia hat maker, because of the quality and durability of his product, corralled the cow country hat trade to such an extent that head pieces on the range universally became known as Stetsons or John B's.
different styles of hat were worn in various sections of the country. On the Mexican border, the true sombrero, steeple crowned, saucer brimmed with a shaggy plush surface was often seen. Though some riders along the border wore the huge straw hats associated with Mexican peons. Generally in the Southwest, wide brims were needed for shade. In the Northwest, a higher crown and narrower brim served better. Texas brush riders wore a style all their own. A wise puncher could tell the state or territory from which a man hailed by the size and shape of his hat. Most cowhands creased the crown of their hats to conform with local custom, but they might leave it untouched or flatten it on top. A crown with four creases on each side was said to keep the head cooler in hot country. In rainy weather, a front crease made a better watershed. The color of a man's hat was a matter of personal choice, though dove gray and light brown were the favorites. Most riders decorated theirs with a band, as both ornament and a means of adjusting the fit to their heads. This band might be a leather strap decorated with silver conches, a hand-woven horsehair band, a string of Indian beads, or rattlesnake skin. Buckskin thongs dangling from the underside of a hat were called bonnet strings, perhaps a crushion, perhaps a corruption of the Spanish barbequeo. They were run through a bead or ring under the rider's chin and anchored the hat during a fast ride or windstorm. When riding a bucking horse, the cowboy used his hat as a wire walker uses a balancing pole. When he was on foot in a branding pen, if some old mother cow came charging in to rescue her offspring from the sizzling iron, a big hat came in handy to throw in the old girl's face, gaining time to straddle a fence. I've had to do that more than once in my life. The wide brim shaded a rider's eyes from the burning sun. In rainy weather, it served as an umbrella, Bent into a trough, it made a drinking cup. Pulled down and tied over the ears, it gave protection from frostbite. It fanned campfires into life and even was used as a pail to carry water and douse the embers. A rustler used his hat to wave around an approaching puncher, signaling that a detour was advisable if the intruder wished to stay healthy. Grass fires had been beaten out by big brimmed hats. The trail boss signaled with his hat, thus avoiding long rides to talk personally with his men. By dint of long use, hats became sweat-stained, disreputable in appearance, were kneaded into diverse shapes, but like wine, their vintage improved with age, and their beauty in the owner's eye never faded. And here are some pictures of hats. Shall we visit the Old West? Let me know.